My name is Melanie Goodfellow and I am Screen International Senior Correspondent for Europe and the Middle East. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our latest Screen Daily Talk. Today we're going to be looking at Saudi Arabia's growing film business on the eve of the inaugural edition of the country's Red Sea International Film Festival. The launch of the festival on December the 6th will fall almost exactly four years to the day that Saudi Arabia announced the lifting of its 35-year cinema ban. Um, and it's seen as a landmark moment for the country's burgeoning film and TV business. Uh, the talk is sponsored by the Red Sea International Film Festival. Uh, uh, the, uh, the talk will last about 30 minutes um, with um, another 30 minutes for Q&A if people want to ask questions. The panelists are very happy to answer questions, so please feel free to, to leave, leave questions in the Q&A box on, on the Zoom. Um, we've got a really packed house, so we're going to have a lot of what rush through quite quick with, quickly with each, each of the people on the panel. Um, just to introduce them, uh, first of all, we have Shivani Pandia Malhotra, who is the managing director of the Red Sea International Film Festival. Many of you on the international film circuit know Shivani as the managing director of Dubai. Um, she has been um, at, with the Red Sea since the beginning and a driving force behind this first edition. Um, then we have uh, Mohamed Hebzi, who is e one of Egypt's best known independent film producers and screenwriters. Um, and he is also the president of the Cairo International Film Festival. So I might pop a couple of questions to you about that too. Um, then we have Mohamed Al Hashemi, who is the country head of Majid Al Futaim Leisure Entertainment Cinemas and Lifestyle in Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, Mohamed is on the panel because he is also responsible for Vox Cinemas and has driven the opening of their theatres in the country. Um, and that's a sort of very exciting development too. Then um, we have two very special panelists. We have uh, Sarah Mesfa, who is a Saudi director and screenwriter. Um, and she will be showing two films at the festival, uh, two omnibus films, uh, Collective. Um, and then a second film called, I'm sure I'm gonna pronounce this wrongly again, but Karawiya, um, which is another omnibus um, uh, festival uh, film, which is going to world premiere at the Red Sea. And I think Becoming is gonna show at Mohammed Hebsi's uh, festival in Cairo. Uh, and then lastly, but not least, is Mohammed Al Hamoud, who we're going to call Hamoud, who Hamoud, um, told me that's probably the best way because we've got three Mohammeds on the call. Um, and you have been a pioneer in terms of introducing making independent cinema in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you ran, you were one of the co-founders of the Talashi Film Collective, which was making films before the ban was lifted. Um, and you now run the Riyadh-based production house Last Seen Films. So uh, it's great to have you all on this panel. Um, I'm really excited to, to learn more because um, obviously for so many years we knew nothing about Saudi Arabia, so it's just a really exciting period um, with all these filmmakers and events coming, coming out. Um, so uh, Shivani, uh, just to get you first, um, so um, we've got, it's a little under three weeks before the festival kicks off. Um, and I was just wondering, are you ready? Because it's the first time that the country has held a festival of this stature. So we're in the process of getting ready. I wish I could say we're ready. Uh, I think I did 14 years of Dubai and I don't think two and a half weeks before we were ready. So we're getting there. Um, things are in place. I mean, we're quite confident in terms of the way everything's headed. We've got our selections done. I think it's just the last bit where we're finalizing uh, all the construction because we're doing the festival in a UNESCO heritage site. So we have a lot of different pop-up venues. So those are getting done. But I think uh, on all the other aspects, I mean, our program's down. We're pretty much with the Red Sea Soup. We've got all the elements in place. We'll be publishing our programs very soon. We've got a project market. Um, and now we're just finalizing all the guests that are going to be coming to the festival. So in the final stages and uh, yeah, and I'm, you know, we're looking forward to it. So we shall be ready for everybody on the 6th of December when the festival starts. So, so you said about these pop up venues, can you just explain a little bit more where exactly we're all going to be sort of going and, 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 and spending our time at the festival? Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. So we are based in a UNESCO heritage site, which is called Al Balad. It's the old town of Jeddah. Uh, it's got a lot of history, goes back 700 years. It's now in the process of being uh, regentrified, where they're actually investing in uh, restoring a lot of the buildings. So we thought it's a great, a great place 
to host a festival and we've created in the courtyards and in the squares we've actually created pop-up venues so we're going to have a gala auditorium uh, which is going to be the Vox Gala Auditorium. And we're going to have cinemas that we're creating, which are the Vox uh, theatres there. Um, we'll also have the Red Sea Souk. So it's going to be a place where everybody uh, is going to be based, and that's going to be our headquarters. Uh, it's in a great environment. It's uh, very unique. It's something that people haven't seen. And I think for us, it's important to have it there uh, to show the heritage of Saudi Arabia. Um, and also, there's got a lot of history. I think a lot of different personalities have been through uh, through Old Town, and um, we just felt it was a great place. So, so do you know how many, roughly, how many international guests are going to attend? Uh, we are expecting about uh, over a thousand international guests that will be coming through. I mean, that, and that sort of leads into my next question, is that when I've been on the, the, the circuit with journalists and other film professionals, I'm still hearing from some of them a sort of retinent, reticence about attending the festival because of Saudi Arabia's uh, human rights track record. And I mean, I just, how do you sit with that? And that sort of, when people, I mean, I'm sure you've had a lot of pushback. So how do you, what's your response to that? I think, I think we've been in existence now as a foundation for two and a half years. And I think people have seen the work that we are doing. We've been running labs. We're there for real. I think our mandate is really to support the industry. Uh, we've been looking at development. We've launched a fund. Um, so for us, it's really important that we actually uh, support the industry locally as well as regionally. Um, and it's not about, you know, I know that a lot of people have said it's a peer and how can, you know, you're there. What is this a big whitewash? But that's the reality of it is there's a true interest uh, in making sure that there is uh, an industry. We are supporting it. We are an enabler. Uh, and I think our focus has been on that. And, you know, I tell everybody, you come and see for yourself. Uh, because I, I've lived in Dubai for 21 years. Until I came to Saudi two and a half years ago, I had a very different vision. I came in and I've seen the creative industry. I've seen the amount of talent that exists. It's unbelievable. And we're enabling everybody. Um, it's going to change the entire region. It's going to be a complete game changer in terms of the volume of business that's going to get done. Uh, the whole region has now almost, you know, I think doubled or tripled and a size, I'm sure Mohammed can tell you, uh, you know, what the predictions are and what the prospects are. Um, so there's, for us, it's really focusing on the talent. We are a cultural event. Uh, we're creating cultural understanding. We are, you know, exposing the talent internationally. We're supporting the Arab region. Um, and for us, it's, that's what it's all about. And I think, you know, as people come in and a lot of you are gonna come in for the first time, uh, I think you're gonna see for yourself what the reality of the situation is. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that people, as you know, change is gradual and I, there has been a lot of change. There's a lot more to be done. Uh, but we, you know, we're getting that and we're, we're very positive with uh, that once people come down, they'll really see for themselves and then their narrative, not ours. And I mean, the program has um, an international uh, side. I was wondering, was it subjected to much, will the films have cuts or censorship or, or were there film, you know, do you have to be sensitive, culturally sensitive to the films that you selected? So I think for us, yes, we have been culturally sensitive, but we're showing films in their entirety. So the entire selection, nothing has been cut. Uh, we will be presenting the films. That's very important to us that we show the, we show the films, uh, you know, are complete. There's no censorship at all. Um, and that's something that we've done. We've done it with, uh, obviously, we've been sensitive to the environment. Uh, but the idea is we've pretty much picked whatever we've liked and we're going to present, I think uh, you've seen our artistic team. Uh, we are going to be looking at films uh, that they've selected and we're going to be presenting it to the audiences. Um, so I, you know, I hope that it's well received. Uh, and uh, we also, I think there's an ownership on the audiences. Um, they know what they're going to be walking into when they're going into the cinema. So it's up to them if they don't want to. And I hope that they, if they feel that they need to be reserved about what they're seeing, they can watch it in, you know, in a different environment and not a public environment. Mm. Uh, but we are definitely showcasing films uh, in their entirety. And then um, in terms of there's, there's a, there are 30 short films from Saudi Arabia, and I think if I counted correctly, seven Saudi features. Um, and I was just wondering their place in the program, is this a token? Uh, presentation of Saudi films or, or do, will they stand up to international scrutiny because the cinema the, the film industry is very young so I was just wondering what your sense of that is. Yeah so I think so I think there's 17 short films and you're right the seven uh, feature length films. Right. Uh, there are actually some absolutely great films that have come out and I'm you know we're really really excited about presenting them to the world. We've also got one in competition 
Uh, and uh, it's not, I don't think it's, you know, just a token where we've sort of put the films in. They're actually great films. Um, and I'm sure a lot of them, when you come and see them, you'll realize even in terms of production quality, uh, they have been quite, they have, they're great. Um, so I'm looking forward actually to presenting these films and pre presenting all the talent that we have to the international industry. I mean, what we've, what they have achieved in the last couple of years is quite substantial. Uh, even during, you know, the, the, the cinema industry opened and then there was COVID. And despite all of that, uh, we've had some great productions. We've had some great content come through. Um, and I, I only see it getting better because I see what's in the pipeline. And I'm hoping in the next few years, we'll we have an abundance of uh, different content coming out of here. Great, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna move swiftly on to, to Mo Hevzi. Um, um, Mo, you're on the call. Um, main, I, we, we brought you onto the talk um, in your capacity as an international producer because you're beginning to, to work with the Saudis and shoot movies there. But you're also uh, the president of the Cairo International Film Festival. Um, and of course, your two festivals are taking place very, very close in dates. And I was wondering how you've dealt with this. Um, I mean, obviously, you must have been going for the same films and, and guests. So how have you have you managed to sort of overcome this, 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 the, the closeness of the dates? Very wisely, if I could say. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> Shivani and I have spoken a few times um, over over the past months, and and um, and it's good to see that spirit of um, communication open communication, collaboration um, between Cairo and Red Sea Film Festival. And um, so we've had talks about dates. Uh, you know, we've had uh, talks about also the common guests that are going to be going hopefully from Cairo to Red Sea. Um, also some collaboration with regards to the Red Sea Souk, you know, the core production market and our Cairo Film Connection and other ways where, you know, obviously there's also films. Um, Becoming, you mentioned Becoming. Becoming is the opening film of the Horizons of Arab Cinema competition, although it's screening out of competition, but it's the opening film. Um, and I know Sarah is one of the filmmakers that, uh, that hopefully will be coming to Cairo. So um, so it's uh, sometimes you, what you may think is, is a bit of a threat at the beginning when you realize that the dates are so close could actually end up, um, becoming an opportunity to to do things um you know together to do things in in harmony um so i think it's gonna work quite, quite well uh hopefully for both festivals mm -hmm. and um and it's it's good because i'm gonna get to see so many friends and so many people in you know the arab and the international film industry both in cairo and in red sea so it's going to be fantastic to you know to have that um uh, you know these these close ties being reignited uh, with such proximity, such close proximity to each other. So I'm actually really excited about it. So and then and I'm going over to your international producers hat. Um, during um, in Cannes, you announced that you were teaming with the Saudi Saudi Arabia's King Abdulaziz Center uh, for World Culture, which is known as Ithra, on a film called Sea of Sands. Um, and I was just wondering whether you had any updates on that. Um, uh, whether it started shooting. And then I don't know whether there were other productions that you have under underway in Saudi that you're able to talk about. Well, I, I that, that film, that project is in development at the moment. Um, and it's gonna be going into production next year with the aim of uh, releasing it in 2023. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I do hope that film will end up in Red Sea Film Festival. I don't know, maybe they'll, <laughs> maybe they'll like it, possibly. Um, but, uh, but yes, I am involved in, in other uh, films with Saudi talents. Uh, and um, I'm talking about, you know, talents in front of and behind the camera. So it's, um, it's just something that I can't um, simply ignore the fact that there, there's a huge opportunity um, and there's a, you know, a, a great market, a really big market that's opening up. Um, and by the way, not just for Saudi films, but for other Arab, um, Arab films for Egyptian films, for example. I mean, um, I'm sure that, um, you know, Orlando or uh, other, you know, other people who work closely in the uh, distribution exhibition sector can tell you how much Egyptian films, for example, have performed so well in the Saudi box office. So when we talk about the Saudi film industry, we can't disregard uh, the exhibition sector, which is growing in such a um, tremendous way. And, and, uh, I think about 400 screens at the moment in Saudi Arabia and looking to rise exponentially over the coming year or two. So, um, so there, there's a huge benefit for us as well as Arab filmmakers. Uh, definitely Egyptian films seem to be 
uh, doing particularly well, but there's no reason why um, other um, other films from other countries wouldn't also do well in the future. Um, you know, you also see some uh, smaller independent films from different Arab countries that are getting some um, a chance to be exhibited even if, if at a, slow, a lower scale in terms of um, the number of screens, but they're still present. Um, we were able to distribute with um, with a Saudi distributor, uh, for example, the Tunisian film that was um, The Man Who Sold the Skin, uh, the film that was Oscar nominated, for example, and that did quite well considering it's, you know, it's an independent, uh, non-Egyptian, non-Hollywood title. So, um, so I think there are great opportunities as, as, a, as a producer and uh, also um, not just for me, but for other producers and filmmakers around the region that are looking to tap into this market and obviously the, the possibility for co-production and, um, and the fund created by the Red Sea Film Festival, which is enormous. And I think it's going to be great help for Arab cinema as well. Uh, obviously, it makes sense that this fund should, first of all, service uh, local productions, but then also expand beyond to Arab African uh, producers making, you know, films and limited series, et cetera. So uh, episodic television. Um, so the ambition is great. And I think the right steps are being taken. Um, and uh, But it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of coordination between, you know, all the stakeholders involved. Because I mean, you, you, you've, um, for example, you filmed um, Amira in Jordan. I mean, I don't know whether you've had experience now yet of filming in in Saudi Arabia in terms of what its facilities like and its crews are like. I don't know how far you are down the line with your other projects. So, um, well, actually, recently I've been involved in two um, two films that were Saudi talent, but um, shot outside of Saudi Arabia. I. I uh, as a distributor and co-producer, minor co-producer, but um, but shooting inside the kingdom, I have not yet done it, and I'm looking forward to doing it next year with uh, Sea of Sands, the project that we've announced, and other projects as well. Um, and um, and but you know, you were you were telling me to put on my producer hat, so I I'm going to the Red Sea Film Festival with Amira. I'm going to the Red Sea Film Festival with um, Hoda Salon and um, and at Feathers. So I mean, these are um, it's it's definitely for us we're very excited to you know finally to be able to show films to saudi audiences uh films you know with different uh, from different scale different types of films and i'm not talking about only purely commercial uh egyptian films but you know films that are very different so um so yeah so i think that's um uh, you know that's we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna discover really quickly what that's uh you know how that's gonna grow over the coming years so, I mean, I think that's a good point to go over to um, Mohammed Al Hashemi um, uh, because uh, Mohammed, uh, it's great to have you on the call because you've been overseeing the launch of the Vox cinemas in Saudi Arabia. So I was just wondering whether you could talk to me a little bit more about that, about how many theaters and how many screens you have currently in Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you. So, um, as we stand today with the latest opening we had in uh, Dubai almost a few weeks back, uh, we stand with 15 locations operating in six cities with 154 screens that have been opened in the past almost two and a half to three years, given the fact we had as well uh, the COVID period in between. Um, so, we stand as uh, the largest exhibitor in screen count and market share, uh, market share as well uh, within the market in Saudi. Now, the experience itself of opening cinemas in Saudi, it might sound easy, it might sound like a market with no cinemas who so just come and open, but it's more of um, an educational and social engineering exercise where we have to open a cinema, you have to open the industry, you have to allow and enable people to go, uh, content to come, and just be the middleman, more or less, to get that social behavior happening within a country that had a cinema uh, ban for almost 35 to 36 years uh, uh, in the country. Now, uh, this is one. The second thing, uh, given the fact uh, we are operational as well in almost all the regions uh, surrounding uh, Saudi, we have seen uh, the Saudi consumer coming to our cinemas in Dubai, in Bahrain, and in, and in Egypt as well. Yet we have not operated in their country itself. So operating within Saudi has as well given us an eye-opener learning on how to deal with the consumer in Saudi, whether they were Saudis or not Saudis, within the land itself. Um, 
it is a beautiful experience. It is something that we have learned a lot from, and it always keeps us on our toes to always uh, provide the best, be the best, and always be up to date to uh, give uh, the best to the Saudi consumer uh, within the company. So I've been to the Vox, those amazing Vox multiplexes in Dubai, which are, you know, very, very luxurious. I mean, how do, how do the complexes that you've put in, built in Saudi compare? Are they as, as, they, are they as up to date? Are, they, uh, are the screens as good? Is it the same experience? You remind me of one beautiful experience that I personally didn't believe in, but when we had to do it, we then said, oh, wow, what is this? So you mentioned something so important the beautiful multiplex in Dubai that is luxurious. And we have one of our iconic cinemas in Kingdom Tower. And I remember when we uh, took the place and we decided to open a cinema, there was one thing that I had been told, uh, build something that no one, ha no one else have experienced or seen. So we built a boutique cinema that is considered the most luxurious cinema in Saudi with even golden, golden plated food in the menu itself. Today, that cinema is the highest and most luxurious cinema in Saudi and within our portfolio itself. Um, it is an experience. It's not just going to the cinema is not just about the movie. You can watch the movie in so many places. As Shifani said, if you don't want to, uh, to watch the movie in a public space, you can watch it in a different platform or maybe a private space. But going to the cinema is more about the experience. It's more about the food. It's more about how you enjoy, how you go into the cinema, how you experience the movie, how you listen, how you watch, how you just escape what you have in life and just be in that movie and then go back to life. It's more about the escape experience. It's more about what comes with the escape experience itself. But, but um, I heard um, that, I mean, I was think I was speaking to somebody else at Vox and they told me that after the first wave of COVID, when cinema started opening again, you were opening them 24 hours a day. How did we that did. work? Did people come to the cinema at 3 p.m. at 3 a.m. in the morning and are they still open on these hours or what's happened since? OK, so, we are, yes, we are still open on those uh, hours. But when we reopened, given the fact we are the largest exhibitor uh, in the region, we took the initiative to re-educate people on going back to the cinema. And going back to the cinema doesn't mean it's a scary experience. It's a safe environment. We didn't think of it as purely commercial. We thought about it as, an, as, as a learning curve, an educating curve to bring people back after almost three and a half months of lockdown and uh, shutting all commercial activities. There, wasn't, there were no cinemas. And then you come and tell me, go to the cinema in a closed environment while COVID is just there. It was more about educating people to go back with safety. Now, when we talk about 24 hours, we are here to create a great moment. And creating a great moment shouldn't be from 9 till 2 a.m. It can be at 3 a.m. And we have most of those frontliners who used to work from the morning till like 1 or 2 a.m. They want to have a laugh. They want to watch a movie. They want to maybe escape the COVID reality and just enjoy a movie for two hours, having a popcorn and teasers, and then going back to reality. Why not offer those people? They have helped us. We are all alive. We're all healthy. I think that was a beautiful move. Yes, it was something to create a great moment, but it was a beautiful move as well to get the momentum back into cinemas. We can see today that people go to the cinemas, the occupancies have gone up, the content lineup has gone back into more or less normal lineups. And it, it required us and others as well to collaborate to bring confidence back to the industry. So, I mean, so we've talked about the, the whole cinema going experience, um, but obviously clearly the films are important. So I just wanted to understand um, in terms of programming, what kinds of films are working in Saudi? I would say uh, the Saudi market is more or less mainly influenced by international studio titles with the exception of uh, Arabic content. When we talk about Arabic content, we talk mainly about Egyptian content and then the, the local produced uh, uh, content in Saudi. Um, it's like any normal market. Um, uh, international titles uh, hit um, and they get uh, the audience that uh, we expect and people expect when it comes to content. So it's more or less a predominant international titles market. And we then tailor each and every single location, like in any other market uh, we operate in. If you go to more of the Emirates, you might have more or less 
all the movies, while in other cinemas that we operate in within Dubai, you might have a more community-focused content that catered to that community itself. Um, I mean, and what's the what what how how do you deal with censorship? I mean, we all read the stories last week about the Eternals not being allowed to play in Saudi. I, I understand that's correct. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? Because that's a huge title, and I'm sure people wanted to see that film. See, that's a huge title, yes. But it, but it's again any country that we operate in, uh, you have to respect whatever the country looks and believe is the best for their people. And uh, we follow in every single country we operate and we follow whatever the government uh, mandate and we respect it. And it actually is something of benefit to the community, to the society and to us as well as uh, operators. Because the film was able to screen in, in uh, UAE, though. Even definitely, in the yes, definitely. So it's still yeah. played, yeah, but just yeah. not in Saudi. So, I mean, and then in terms of um, like local content, because obviously this talk is about the Saudi film industry. I mean, is there any appetite for um, Saudi films or, or film? Have, has anybody produced a film that can, can work in a cinema yet that, that you've tried out? It's a beautiful question, and I would like to uh, maybe uh, give an example on two case studies that we have. Uh, back in 2018, um, we signed up with uh, Mercot to distribute uh, Masamir. Uh, Masamir is one of the uh, locally produced <clears throat> contents in Saudi. Um, so the reason why we use this as an example of a case study is basically Masamir was filmed as a short uh, uh, series episode for almost 120 episodes on YouTube uh, prior to cinemas being uh, cinema uh, cinema band being lifted in Saudi, and it had more than one billion views on YouTube. So the question was, why not to get those 120 episodes and then recreate them on the uh, big screen and have it as a movie for people to just enjoy in, in a cinema environment? So when we got it into the cinema as distributors, it actually worked. And it was a good example for one of the first uh, Saudi local content to be uh, featured on, on, on the cinema. A second example of a movie we distributed is uh, uh, Born a King, uh, and it talks about King Faisal. King Faisal is very well known in Saudi, yet is also very well known within uh, the GCC uh, region itself. And it was a good case study to evaluate how Saudi local content will react within, the, uh, within Saudi itself and then within regional markets. So we've seen it uh, on the big screen in cinemas for almost 13 to 14 weeks in Saudi and for up to nine weeks in Dubai. Right, And right. it's not a locally UAE produced movie, it's a Saudi movie. Right, right. So just, I mean, one last question um, before I move on to, to Sarah and Hamoud. Um, you, do you have, I mean, I've heard some crazy projections for the box office, the expected box office for Saudi Arabia. What's your latest estimate for box when you look at that market? And has, has it already overtaken the Emirates now as, as a, a theatrical market? See, from a global box office, yes, uh, it competes eye to eye, if not more than uh, with the UAE. Um, but it has as well its own uh, specifications and uh, uh, things to look into. It's an emerging market, and you can't uh, compare an emerging market with a mature market like Dubai. This is one. Uh, the second thing, today where we stand, it's a non-measurable market given the disturbance that happened. Uh, Dubai opened up, even with the airport back in May uh, 2020, while Saudi opened just recently, with one partial lockdown, commercial lockdown in February uh, 2021. It has its own specifications. We believe that the market will go back uh, to normal within 2022 to 2023, but still it is an emerging market that is from a global uh, box office, uh, looks into eye to eye with a mature market like Dubai. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so, so now much. we're gonna move on to the two Saudi filmmakers who we hope are going to um, start filling cinemas one day um, with their films. So Sarah, um, it's great to meet you um, here on Zoom. Um, you've got, you're involved in two films, as I said in the introduction, you've got Becoming, which is going to world premiere, um, as, as Mo Hebsi said, in the, the Arab competition. It's gonna, um, it's not in competition, but it's uh, the opening film. Um, and then you've got uh, the uh, Quaria, uh, which is going to world premiere in Red Sea. And I was just wondering how you're feeling ahead of these two, these two screenings. I mean, what's the sensation for you as you, as you get ready for these two feature films to, to meet their audiences? 
uh, well, that's the first time I'll be screening like two feature films. It's not like the length of the film is not, yeah, I mean, mine are, are not featured with shorts. This, this is the first yeah, time. Yeah, within the film, yeah. On, in, in, an, uh, in a larger audience. I've screened my film in Cairo last year. I'm expecting the same energy. I'm expecting the uh, same thing. This for Red Sea, I'm still, I have no expectation. I'm, I'm very excited. This, this is what I'm going to figure out. But so I'm definitely looking forward to it because uh, when I screened my film uh, in Jeddah, that was one of my best screenings because it's around your family, it's around the crew work and the film, the actors and the actresses and, and the crew members. So did you start making, can you just talk to me a little bit about your career direct, direct, trajectory? Did you um, start making films before the, 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 the cinema ban was, um, was lifted, the announcement was made that it was going to be lifted? Or, or did you start afterwards? How did you get involved in cinema? I was already studying that and it started 2016. Um, well, studying cinematic arts requires you to make a short film uh, every, in every course. So mm -hmm. I started making these films, these short films, and they were like these uh, personal films, the docu-fiction films, I document myself daily. Um, so I've started making these shorts uh, before, before, the, before having cinemas in Saudi Arabia. Then by the time uh, the, the pan was lifted, I was making my first short, uh, which is The Girls Who Burned the Night. Um, by the time quite, I finished. Mm. Just quite pushing boundaries in a way for the story it tells about these teenage girls who go a bit crazy when they're not allowed to go to the grocery store. I mean, did you feel when you were making it that, um, that you were pushing boundaries or were you scared that people might be surprised by the story you were telling or was it just totally natural to you that you were making that story? It was natural. I've never thought that people would react like they wouldn't accept it in a way. I've, I've never thought of that. Um, and I've never gotten this, this reaction that we don't like what we, uh, we see when uh, you're pushing boundaries. I think it's just, it's, it's just a simple story that tells a lot about anger and, and um, crossing some lines. <laughs> and I mean, but, what, but just going back to your original idea about going into cinema and, and, and studying it, but why did you do that? Because at the time there was no way to show your movie uh, or your films at home. So why did you do that? It's, I'm just I have no idea. I wouldn't know to do. Yeah, I wouldn't do anything else. I wouldn't know how to do it. If it wasn't for cinema, I wouldn't do anything else. So, right, right. So, I mean, um, and one of the questions we've discussed this beforehand, but I mean, a lot of when I speak to people about the Red Sea is really getting behind the whole idea of female filmmakers and it's part of their branding and their advertising. And a lot of people outside of the region, when I talk to them about this, say, but it's just a PR stunt. It's, it's like whitewashing. I mean, how do you feel about this? You're showing your films there um, and you're part of this. So do you feel that's the case as a filmmaker? And, what, and, and where do you, how do you feel as a female filmmaker in Saudi Arabia and your opportunities and, and you know what you can say there? You hear this thing a lot. It, it, it happens in everything. It happens with brands, it's institution. You hear the same thing. They're only doing this for the public relation. And I understand um, some, some institutions, some brands, they, they do that. I'll, I'll give an example. There is this brand, whatever this brand is, they're making sure it's about uh, uh, women is the future. Um, does that bother me? No. Uh, when does it bother me? When this same brand, slave women, like working 24 hours to make these shirts, some women, then they're saying they're supporting women. So whenever there is contradiction, then this is where uh, I, I wouldn't like it. Or I would say um, um, we should change that. But other than that, public relation wouldn't, wouldn't uh, bother and, or hurt anyone. And uh, here I am making like, Two, two films and screening in it in, in the first edition. So we'll see that. I think in the future, these things will, will, will show more if we're continuing on the same level, pushing more or going forward or going backward. I think we'll see it. Right, yeah. So it'd be, the, the proof will be what happens in the coming years. Exactly. Yeah. You wouldn't know. So um, are you working, you've got these two projects, these two, two films coming out, as you said, they're omnibus films, so you have film, made segments in those films, but um, have you got other projects, are you working on a feature film idea um, that you've got in the, in the woodwork that you can talk about? Or? Well, I'm developing my first feature because these things take time, so I'm planning to shoot uh, my, my third short as well very soon, within, within the next year. 
but no feature film planned just yet. It's in the development phase. Oh, true as well. Okay, okay. Um, and then just, I mean, where would you, when you're sitting here now, where would you like to see the Saudi film industry in 10 years time? What would your dream scenario be? I'll talk as a filmmaker. As a filmmaker, you would definitely want to see more established industry, that you don't have to worry about finding enough crew members to make this film. You don't have to worry about getting funds. You don't have to worry about distributing your film, the whole process of the film that goes normal and see. And you, you worry about actually, how do you, how do you let the story out of, out, out of yourself, not how do you technically make it? That's what I would love to mm. have. Mm. And so, um, Hamoud, just um, going on to you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, so I was, I mean, as I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of amazed when I was reading your CV about how you set up the Talashi Film Collective and you were making short movies that were then getting shown um, in festivals in the region, but could never be shown in Saudi. And it's the same question that I put to Sarah. It's like, why did you do that when you couldn't necessarily show your movies at home and it was something that was banned? I was just wondering what, what drove you to, to, to take that course. Um, I think I, I liked movies. This is the simple answer. Um, maybe pissing my parents, <laughs> I don't know. You know, like anyone young, because you want to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I started uh, uh, involved in making films, I was in my early 20s. Um, probably I would have been writer, if, uh, or maybe I would have been singer or, or whatever, like any, any sort of uh, artistic expression back in the day, but cinema was the closest thing. And also sometimes uh, coincidence because through uh, online platforms like uh, Saudi back in the day, the early 2000s, uh, internet forums was, was the main, uh, uh, basically the main gathering or the main public space to, if you have a hobby, if you like something. So actually I got into filmmaking through a cinematic forum, like through, and this is how I met the Kalashi uh, members. This is how we started. And it happens that Dubai Film Festival or the early version, the Gulf Film Festival was still uh, in the launch in 2006, I guess. It was Musabaqat Aflam al Emirat, I think. It was the Emirati uh, film festival, but they, they allow like some Gulf countries. And one of our friends, he experimented with this camera and he made this short, and we didn't even know what a short film is. And then we start going to these festivals. And by 2007, I, start, I made it my first short. And then 2008, I established the last film with other filmmakers in Saudi. But yeah, I, I didn't know what's the reason. I didn't have Super 8 when I was young. It wasn't that story. It just a uh, simple way of just doing something different, I guess. And, so, and then, then, so you went and studied cinema in the US. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, I studied, I did MFA in film in, in, uh, in San Francisco. And I went back maybe 2015. Since then, I was back and forth from the US and Saudi. Um, I was freelancing maybe. And then uh, after a while, I, I, I started, and by 2017, I, 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 I launched the last thing films, which is, it was still like a very small, it's like freelance work, but now legally I can get paid of, of making films. Right, right. And yeah, I developed like a few titles, one feature and, and a few shorts. And, and I, eventually it was, it was happening actually. And then like when I, when I developed my, 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 my first feature last visit, we were actually about to shoot before the Allah cinema. Oh really? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and then we get the fund from Ithra, and when we get to the fund, actually, there were no cinema in Saudi. And then we have to actually to delay the process of, 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 of the filming because now there's a distribution uh, factor on, on, on the film because it was like this like, grant, you make a film, show it like in neighboring countries, film festival, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, yeah, and then uh, it was like the, the process was uh, actually too cool. Sometimes I can't even imagine how fast it was. I'm talking like two, two or three years ago, or just uh, starting doing this, this feature. Now we have like an actual, not industry, but now we are talking about international film festival, which is like, uh, I couldn't even imagine that would happen someday here. So, but, but how, are you, um, how are you finding the talent? I mean, it, uh, whenever I like start looking at filmmakers or trying to do like talent lists, it's like, it's just crazy. There's so many young people with great ideas coming out of Saudi, but how do you find talent? Are there people you've worked with for a long time or 
actually one of the new talents I like is Sarah Miss, for example. Uh, Effet, for example, Effet University. I mean, in Saudi now, it's sadly actually, you know, we don't have that much uh, like cinema lovers or cinema like uh, centric. Most of them now, if they like to do anything, they just go to, you know, corporate or making ads, except maybe in Jeddah because of Effet University. And then when I made like my two short on one, my, my, my feature, actually I recruit a lot of uh, grad, grad, graduates from, from Effet University. And now I'm happy with the Red Sea Film Festival. I'm hoping to like cultivate this uh, community based. Uh, uh, but most of the filmmakers, back to your question, I work with actually like old colleagues that, that who I we really trust each other vision, uh, some technical challenges, which should, we can resolve it through. Again, I agree with Sarah, some technical difficulties. Uh, this is, we solve it through bringing uh, uh, filmmakers from maybe Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Jordan, you know, like speci especially technical crew. But in terms of director, I think we have uh, young talents, also writers, but we have really, really lack of technical uh, film, like cinematographer, sound, post production editors, almost not a single one professional, you know, you can find in Saudi. So, I mean, um, it's a question also just for both of you actually going back to, because I think you both mentioned it to me in the past. I was wondering, um, that Haifa Al-Mansour is one of the people who's going to get a lifetime achievement and be tributed um, at the Red Sea. And I was wondering whether she had had any impact on your decisions to go into cinema with Wadja, whether that had been a moment for you or not. I don't know, uh, Hamoud first and maybe Sarah afterwards. Actually, I knew of Haifa first uh, when, he, when she was making her uh, shorts at, uh, again, the Gotham Festival, the early version. Uh, then they had, she had this documentary, it was like, uh, all over the news, it was controversial, uh, about her, you know, the religious police and so on. So she's definitely one of the pioneers that, you know, I know of even before making Wajda. And actually I saw Wajda in, uh, in the film theater in San Francisco, in a commercial film theater. And I was so happy, I couldn't imagine, you know, just to go to the theater and to the cinema. And it made actually really well. It stayed almost for two months in, in the cinemas. Uh, so she's definitely in that sense, uh, Regardless of the topics of her films, uh, she, as a filmmaker, she's definitely uh, uh, one of the pioneers. And, and, and uh, even in the early stages of cinema, when I was making films, I was thinking of, uh, of her as a filmmaker. And as um, Sarah, are you able to? So I was just wondering, because you mentioned her as well when we were talking. I wanted to be a filmmaker before which they came. Right. They came out. But when I saw the trailer, of, I remember when I saw the trailer, I didn't even watch the film. But I was like, OK, there is this door that, that I can actually knock and, and open. Uh, if she can make that, I can, I can make that as well. And definitely growing up, especially in the Middle East, you don't see a lot of, of, of uh, female filmmakers. You don't know about them. You mostly see like, uh, um, male filmmakers or like the news you don't know about. It. And especially, like I grew up in, in, in an uh, in an environment that you either see like uh, commercial films or uh, films that talks about women by a male gaze. So you don't know much about that. So when I saw that, definitely that changed something. So I'm gonna just go over to some of the questions now that have been sent through to me. Um, I'm just trying to um, just go back through. Um, oh, hold on one minute. Uh, oh, hold on. Might just have to look here. I'm going to look in here. Sorry. So I'm going to. So I've got. Um, can't answer all of these questions because we don't have experts for all of these these questions on on the panel. Um, but I have one. So I think this can go to Sarah and Hamoud. I've got one. For the person hasn't named who they are, but they said for filmmaker for for the filmmakers. Do you feel any pressure on your freedom to tell particular stories from the Saudi state or from anywhere else? So do you censor yourself at all when you make your films? Sada, I'll ask you first. I do make my films and I don't know what's the limit, but I just make them. I don't actually think about it. When I, when I, when I write a script, I don't think of, of if, if I should take this out or how, how, should I, how should I present this? I just make them and, and I'll see because this, it's, it's an emerged cinema. You'll just see what's your, what's, what can be out and what not. So until this moment, I did not face anything. I don't know. 
Um, and Hamoud, for you? Uh, not at the moment, not yet. Uh, all the films, all the ideas actually I'm developing. Uh, or even the film I developed already and I released one in the cinema. I haven't had any issues. Uh, there is some self-censorship which happens to any artist, any filmmaker, and I guess it happens everywhere. There is some certain issues, you know, you, uh, we, we are not making movies to just provoke. Uh, but in terms of topics, uh, definitely all the films, um, I mean, even some of it, we get actually funds, for, for local funds, uh, and some like from outside there, they might consider it, oh, this is like a daring idea, but it, it passed. Uh, and, and also there is different kind of censorship. We have like uh, uh, fund usually they are more flexible, but then when you go to the cinema, uh, actually I saw Saudi films, Shams al uh, which is now on Netflix. It's actually, I was surprised when I saw it in the cinema. Which, sorry, which film? So which film is that? Book of the Sun. Uh, the, 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 the topic, uh, the, the subtext, uh, even the vulgar language, uh, I was surprised uh, when I saw it. Uh, and, and I think it, even in neighboring countries, maybe you cannot show uh, some of the language in that movie. Uh, and also this movie, because it also because of that movie, now it created a lot of new filmmakers that they have this uh, kind of, there is, now there is a gap, you know, that there is, you can say so much more than Shams al or all around Shams al which is actually, I was surprised even to see it in the Saudi cinema. Right, right. I mean, I mean I, when I've interviewed Haifa al-Mansur, sometimes, I think she's sometimes said it's not even a question of the authorities censoring you. Sometimes you just have to be sensitive to people, to society, to the population who maybe might not be ready to see certain stories. But I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know whether either of you have feel that or not. I think that happens everywhere. I guess that's my, uh, my point. Now, even, yeah. even if you are in the state, even if you are in Europe, there's some type whatever topic, maybe you have some issues actually from uh, different parties, different ideologues, different... Uh, so, you, so sometimes it comes from within, within the filmmaker itself, you know, what you could say, how you represent minorities, how you represent women. So all these topics, it has to come within. Uh, so far, I haven't had issues, and I agree with the uh, uh, we, we're still emerging uh, cinema. We don't know how it's, uh, in the next few years, we will know much more, you know? in terms of censorship, in terms of uh, uh, what topics even the, the society they will be, uh, you'll be surprised and you might actually have censorship from something you cannot even imagine, you know, for example, tribalism, maybe it's more sensitive if you talk about it than maybe sexuality, I don't know. Um, just tribalism. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like so there is some topics we didn't know actually, we haven't, it hasn't been tested yet on cinemas. Right, right. So I'm going to go through the rest of these questions. Um, so, there's a question here, uh, Shivani, uh, sort of going on, moving on from what Hamoud said, um, and it's in the question box. Um, um, and they're asking, well, I mean, obviously there was the controversy over Eternals, and they're asking, will there be any LGBTQ guests or participants at the Red Sea Film Festival? Um, I think, I, I, for me, it's a, the answer is, you know, very obvious. I think it's a very strange question, of course, I mean, then no, nobody make, is making any uh, differences on people's orientation. And then Mohammed Al Hashemi, um, I have another question for you, asking, um, what are you, given that the uh, cinema was banned for 35 five years, um, what are you doing at Vox, to, specifically doing at Vox to change public um, behavior and encourage people to engage with cinemas um, after all of this time? Maybe you don't have uh, to, I don't know, but you know. See, apart from getting uh, the, the, the right content into Saudi, is as well uh, recreating that industry um, by uh, uh, the local content, by the experience itself, and by making it part of uh, people's uh, social uh, uh, routine. Uh, going to a cinema shouldn't be something out of a routine. It can be one of the weekly things that you do or one of the monthly things that you do um, in, normal, in normal life. Yeah. Are you doing any sort of specific um, events like Q and A's? Do you get directors in? Do you do do you do events around issues? Do you do some of that type of stuff? Yeah, definitely we do. 
uh, we do premieres. Uh, we have premieres. We have uh, themed uh, uh, movie uh, uh, nights, as an example. It's more about tailoring it and trying to make it more personalized for people to have it more accepted and more uh, as well um, wanted by people to go. Um, let alone the assets itself. So if you go to one of the cinemas that we have in Harriet, it's not just a cinema. It's a cinema with a bowling where people can enjoy bowling and then go to the cinema or enjoy bowling after coming out of a cinema. And the one, the first cinema that we have opened in, in Saudi, in Riyadh Park, it's a cinema with a family entertainment center and a bowling and restaurants. It's more of an experience by itself. It's not only about the premieres uh, that we do. It's not, about, uh, it's not only about the content that we get. It's more about the experience itself. It's, just, it's, it's not just a cinema. It's a cinema with an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's another question here. We don't really have anybody on the panel who could specifically answer this question. Um, it's a question from John Dirty um, saying, in growing the film industry in Saudi Arabia, you mentioned production and exhibition. What does the future of film education look like? And how does it fit in with the long-term goal of industry expansion? We don't really have anybody from that sector here, but Sara and Hamoud, obviously, you're young filmmakers. Sara, you went to, um, you studied uh, film. How, what was your experience? And do you feel like um, the film schools are expanding or trainees expand? And even Hamoud, maybe when you're looking for, you were talking about there not being enough uh, crew, maybe, and stuff like that. Uh, so there is like um, the Ministry of Culture last year, I think, they opened the um, scholarships for filmmaking, music, art, and, and a lot of these things. And I've heard about universities that are planning to do filmmaking. Um, now, the only thing in Saudi is effort is, is, uh, is un only for, for, uh, for uh, women uh, to study uh, this major. This, uh, I, see, I see a lot of planning towards uh, an educational um, uh, way of, of, of entering the cinema industry. So, so for example, like there are, I, I do see there are like workshops sometimes and one-off events that people attend. It seems to be quite a, a, a lot network. of workshops, actually a lot of workshops. So like done by Ithra or sometimes like NBC, I think has something yeah. that, I mean, I do see there's a lot of stuff, but there's no official, apart from your fact, there's no official school as yet. Yeah, no, no, there is a lot, a lot. And uh, Hamoud, do you have anything to add to that? Because you studied in the States, but I don't know if you feel like it's changing now. Um, yeah, I mean, Effet, which is, by the way, it's a female-only school, uh, and it, it was, it is the only filmmaking school actually in the country, it's been that for a while. Uh, we haven't yet any, any film school, an actual film school, which is actually, uh, to start an industry, you definitely need to have a film school. Uh, for example, in Egypt, you have like a generation of filmmakers coming out from the High Institute of Cinema in Egypt. Uh, uh, same thing in, in NYU, take like or, or USC. You did, like if you have a film school, there you have like a few generations, and then you have like uh, every now and then you will have young talent coming fresh from school. And this is you don't have to worry to creating like a community of films. Uh, I mean, a community of filmmakers with like cinema lovers, etc. Uh, I think now definitely uh, with expanding in cinema, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm sure within five years. We will have like an actual film school in the country, which is definitely important, yes. Okay, um, and Hamoud, while you're here, another question, and maybe um, uh, Mohebzi as well, uh, have a question saying, how easy do you find it to collaborate with other nations, both inside and out of the Gulf region? So um, maybe Hebzi, just to get you to come on Hebzi, you were talking about working with Saudis and Egyptians. Is that happening yet where you've got co production I mean, obviously you're working on Saudi productions, but are you seeing, like wholesale collaboration on that way yet? Yes, I am seeing that. Um, I, I've heard of several projects that are um, uh, Saudi Egyptian projects. Uh, there are other Arab Arab co-production initiatives that are you know that are happening. I've been uh, you know I did a co-production with Jordan this year. Uh, Amira is is an Egyptian Jordanian uh, Palestinian co-production, um, and with Saudi Arabia, I. I um, Yes, I can definitely see things in development. I haven't seen anything actually released yet uh, that is purely Egyptian Saudi, but uh, but I think that's um, I don't think there's anything at an official level. I mean, there's no core production treaty. There, there's nothing of that sort. But I think on the company's level, I I, I see a lot of people trying to um, you know to make that happen. Mm 
I mean, sort of linked to this question, um, do you, I mean, I know it's happening more in television now, but do you see a situation where you could be like mixing Emirati, Egyptian, Saudi talent on the big screen? Do you think that could work or is that still complicated? You might end up with like the Euro pudding like we had in, in, in Europe for a while. Well, I've done that before with, with a, a film from called From A to B, which had a Saudi character and Emirati uh, and uh, a Syrian character and an Egyptian character as the main characters. Um, but, um, but yes, I could definitely, I mean, it's, it's television is kind of leading the way in that. Um, but I think that, um, I think that in cinema, it really just, it has to be organic. I don't think it's a good idea to, you know, to set off with the mindset of, I just want to make a film with, you know, three characters from three different countries. I think this, this, it has to serve the story. I think the story has to be designed in a way, whereas it feels organic and, and, um, and not contrived. Uh, and authentic so um so I, I definitely see more of that happening in cinema but um but we haven't seen much of it on the screen yet right right um and then i've just got a question maybe for Mohammed al hashemi um is there a market for non-hollywood independent foreign language films in saudi arabia so do you think we're going to start seeing french movies or parasite or uh, you know playing playing on screens or maybe they already are in saudi they are already in Saudi. Uh, we had an experience with a Korean movie, and surprisingly enough, the Saudi nationals that are fans of Korean movies was beyond what we expected as a company and what I personally expected to uh, happen in Saudi. I was comparing it, with, uh, comparing it with, with us in Dubai, but surprisingly enough, there is, and especially with uh, certain Asian uh, content or certain European uh, content, uh, uh, apart from uh, Hollywood, basically, and uh, the general Bollywood uh, content that we get into Saudi. But there is. Um, and then there's a question, thank you. And there's a question that keeps coming sort of up. Um, there's sort of lots of the questions along these lines is maybe for Sada and Hamoud and, and uh, maybe Shivani, um, there's what is that? What is the one misconception about the Saudi industry that you would like to see corrected? It's not my question. It's a question that's out there. Is there anything that you get asked repeatedly and you? You, you would like people to understand, Sarah. <laughs> I think there is a lot. I can't come up with something now, but I personally, I'm, yani, I'm not interested to correct any misconception. Yani, we all has, yani, we all have misconceptions, and um, these things come up. It comes with days, and yani, you fix it with days. Um, it gets to you naturally. You don't you don't push for it so hard. You don't have to prove anything. At least not me. I don't know if Hamoud has got anything to add on that. That's exactly what she said. You know, sometimes you go to a QA, you have to explain the history, the historiography <laughs> of Saudi, and it's not your job. You just want to take about the film you know, from filmmaking this perspective. Uh, which is rewarding. This is why you want to be like a filmmaker. You know, I know I'm a Saudi filmmaker. I'm an Arab filmmaker, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I hope like one day this we talk like about cinema or the subject matters and, and all that. To handle the film as film, not as a case, as, a, as an emotional journey and not only seeing it as coming from this country and not seeing it as coming from a woman, because once you, you call the film directed by a woman, then you, you're, not think, you're not thinking this is a normal thing. You're already uh, labeling it. So just like, looking at the film as a film. Well, I think that's a good point to like draw this conversation to an end, unless anybody has any burning thing that they want to say before we, we close. I'd just like to say thank you to everybody, Shivani, Mohevzi, Mohammed Al Hashemi, Sarah uh, and Hamoud. Um, it's just been great talking to you. Um, there were a lot of you on, on the talk, so we had to like jump backwards and forwards between different subjects. Um, I'm really sorry if I haven't um, addressed all the questions in the Q&A. Um, the recording for this, this Screen Daily Talk will go up on Screen International tomorrow with a write-up. So if you want to listen to it again, please do. Um, and I look forward to seeing, I uh, hopefully, most of you in uh, Jeddah very soon. So um, thank you very much um, for, for listening in. <laughs>